Well, welcome um, to another uh, panel this afternoon. We have so many amazing speakers. I know we also had a pretty jam-packed morning, so thank you everyone who came by. Um, I wanted everyone here on the panel to do a quick round of introductions. I can start. I'm Clara Tao. I'm the founding officer for Filecoin Foundation. We're so excited to be here this week and also to talk about today's really important topic, data at the center of decentralized compute storage and AI. Um, so Neil, want to kick things off? Uh, hey, everybody. Does it work? Oh. I think so. Do you want to? Yeah, yeah, just talk. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Anil Murthy, and I lead the product and engineering team at Overclock Labs. Overclock Labs is the creator and the core contributor to Akash Network. And uh, Akash Network, hopefully a few people have heard of it, is uh, the uh, world's first super cloud. Uh, we are a full service cloud that provides all sorts of compute resources. Um, more recently, we've been very focused on accelerated compute, primarily uh, driven by demand and AI. And, uh, one thing that is pretty unique to Akash is that we're radically open source, meaning not only is our source code entirely open, but we also build in the open. Hello, I'm Angelo Shelley. Um, where do I start? Uh, big background in um, data center infrastructure, big focus on security, network infrastructure, and, and got into storage uh, a long time ago and uh, kind of threw out my building and, and creating a hosting company in Belgium. I, I, I fell into this beautiful ecosystem called Filecoin like years ago, was there before mainnet, started as one of the storage providers there. Um, and, and I saw the need for like uh, an easy way to store data on Filecoin. And, and like, you know, in the previous panel, they talked about that a lot too. And kind of looking for that easy way in because of my customers also through my hosting company wanted to store data on Filecoin. So came up with this idea on an easy drag and drop solution that I built years ago called Decentrally. Um, I'll, I'll showcase that tomorrow too. That's that's a different story. And um, throughout that that journey, I just saw that throughout the need of also decentralization and storage, Akave was born. That's what I'm talking about here today. So I'm I'm, I'm the CTO at Akave. Um, we're building the first um, layer two data chain. Uh, we're basically trying to bring all these enterprise features to uh, Filecoin. Um, we have, we've seen the need for that, that easy way because of like a lot of storage admins, they are looking for, you know, how do I adopt this? And they don't want to go through code or, or use that like, uh, uh, like that, that very complex SDK that's out there. They just want like an S3 object interface to use or they, they see like all the benefits that are out there and they're kind of trying to, you know, adopt it, but they see that it's just like not, not that easy to do. And uh, from that need, a coffee got born and we kind of are um, expanding on that more and like talking about that tomorrow more during the, the Phil Duff Summit and uh, bring a demo there and see how that, how that like looks like. Amazing, and, and Tom, over to you. Thank you, um, great to be here, nice to see you. Uh, Tom Trowbridge, I am co-founder of Fluence. Fluence is a cloudless compute platform, and uh, what, we, what that means to us is decentralized serverless compute. And so we believe that the future is effectively cloudless, and you have decentralized payments in terms of Bitcoin, Ethereum, everything else, and you have decentralized storage, largely thanks to um, Filecoin um, and IPFS, and decentralized compute is the next kind of and final real frontier to full decentralization. Um, not dissimilar from what Akash is doing, um, we feel we need to build this decentralized compute for a couple reasons. One of them is you eliminate single points of, um, of censorship and failure, but the other is also if you have a really clearly decentralized network where the switching costs um, are effectively zero, you can compete compute down in price to the marginal cost electricity and of maybe some cost, of maybe some hardware cost. So we think that democratizes access to compute, use of compute, um, and ultimately um, makes everyone um, not dependent on on the uh, on centralized clouds. So. Uh, that's, um, that's what we're doing at Fluence. We, we launched the network and the token in March. Um, and actually, Fluence is now a DAO in Switzerland, and I'm at Cloudless Labs, which is the renamed Fluence Labs Delaware company. 
And, uh, and before Fluence, I helped found this other sponsor, Hedera, which I'm happy to see here, which I did not know, but um, <laughs> good to see that. So uh, good to be here. Amazing. Well, um, we're so happy to hear about each and every one of your guys' companies. There's a lot of smart brains here in this room. I did want to first ask the question to all of you. Um, a lot of people complain pro uh, blockchain doesn't have product market fit. Um, a lot of people are not as familiar with the decentralized storage space, but why decentralized compute? Why decentralized AI? Why decentralized storage? What is, um, what is the demand that you guys are seeing as you're going along this journey with each of your companies that were new problems that today centralized computer, centralized cloud can't solve? And I think some of you guys may have already touched upon this in your intros, but would love to maybe start with you and Neil and then go down. Yeah, yeah sure, happy to take that. So um, if you think about, so just starting sort of with, at a high level with AI, right? People talk about why does AI need to get decentralized? Um, the way I think about it is, uh, if you look back, if you think AI is probably the biggest technological innovation since the internet, which you know, un unarguably it probably is, um, the thing that made the internet so widely accepted and, and resulted in a lot of innovation on, on the internet is the fact that it was not constrained among a few companies. It was widely open uh, and it was built in a very open fashion, right? Um, so I think from that perspective, uh, the same thing applies to AI. And if you think about what are the key components for AI to mature and grow and innovate, um, it starts from the infrastructure layer, and that consists of compute, storage, and networking primarily. There's a lot more other things to it. There's data and other things as well. But at the very infrastructure layer, it's compute, data, and uh, compute, uh, networking, and storage. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the high-level thing. And then when you actually think about compute today, um, what enables AI today is primarily accelerated compute. Uh, and that's just a fancy or a more generalized term for GPUs, right? Um, it just so happens that even though there are multiple vendors of these GPUs today, there's AMD, there's NVIDIA, there's Intel, uh, all of these different companies, the one company that has really nailed the software stack is NVIDIA. And so for that reason, they're in this really um, sort of unique position of being the sole provider of um, the core computer infrastructure for AI. So what that has caused is basically this mad rush for acquiring NVIDIA GPUs, and it's caused uh, the really big companies, whether you're talking about the hyperscalers like AWS and GCP and Azure, or even tier two uh, cloud providers, as well as big tech companies like Meta and Tesla, uh, they've pretty much acquired a vast amount of these GPUs because they have the capital to do it, and uh, they're sitting on these GPUs. And so if you as a startup, want to innovate in AI today, similarly how you, the way you would want to innovate in the 90s on the internet, uh, there's no way for you to get access to the compute that enables you to go and innovate in AI. Uh, and so that's a significantly uh, large problem for AI innovation going forward if you subscribe to the idea that it needs to be open, right? And so uh, coming back now to uh, the, the compute problem and solving it with decentralized systems, the best way to uh, give access to things in the open is to essentially make it available in a marketplace, and that's kind of the problem that we're trying to solve, at least at Akash. Amazing, and Angelo, you've obviously seen this problem firsthand from being a storage provider yourself, and also working with different clients, having demand to store on Filecoin and other decentralized services, so do you wanna talk about your Yeah, experience? definitely, um, I'll look at more from like the storage angle uh, where you see demand come in and, and you see that enterprises are really looking for like something really reliable. They want something easy to scale, like and, and they want something secure. Like these are things that can definitely be brought through, like for instance, Filecoin and like Akave being, bringing those features to those customers because in the end, like, when you look at it, they want to. They, they have interest in in all the decentralized storage, and uh, we have questions coming in from compute providers and and from AI providers that want to have that easy way of storage close to them, uh, specifically on like when they want to store an LLM or iterate on it, or they want to like just do some uh, inferencing on it, and they want to have like that that like also uh, that that altruistic view of I want to use kind of decentralized storage so they want to look at it and adopt it but when they start looking into it they see like whoa whoa they're still a little bit like well this is not that easy to use 
but still they're like pushing forward and trying to adopt it. And in that way, they're also like definitely diving deep into this. Like, and, and what I mean by that is like what I just mentioned on the security side, they'll definitely see that, ooh, this decentralized storage that really brings more benefits. Like for instance, when I store it in like one localized area at like a large cloud provider or on like a, a private provider, you'll see that this creates like for instance a single point of targeted attacks for instance like while when you work with Filecoin or like a Kavi as a, as a storage uh, a layer you'll see that because of all the different nodes and the fast like network that it provides targeting then is all that in total is nearly impossible as, as impossible I would say that from that perspective storage admins see a lot of that benefits coming up and that's why they see that you know that, that these benefits are coming in. And then also because like they see like, oh, the extra added security comes with scalability as, uh, on top of that, which they see as a, as a huge benefit. And after you have these conversations purely on the tech, like, like bringing that to the network, they see like, oh, it also is bringing lower costs. So, so having that conversation and explaining to enterprises and, and users on all the benefits that it brings they can also see like, okay, like our, our, our compute stacks that we are using today can benefit from that storage offering directly. And I think the more and more we talk about it, uh, the more and more it gets talked about around Deepin, the more and more these projects come out, like Fluence and Akash, it gets way more known and, and alongside storage gets pulled into that. Like my experience is always that all the cool stuff gets built first and then networking and then storage and then that's kind of like the the, the, the infrastructure part we're at. Yeah, and, and I'm sure, you know, uh, fr from your background also, in being a storage provider, I think the other amazing element about marketplaces for compute, for storage, is you get a lot more customization when you're coming from the client perspective. Instead of going to one single, uh, major monopoly to say, I want this, you can work with a storage provider to store enterprise data, to store your, your local data, right? To, um, to find all these iterations that are so easy to cus customize at a fraction of the cost and also have a lot more optionality. I, so. I can add a little bit to that. That's kind of the reason why Decentrally got born initially because I just got the question from a customer and I was like, sure, I can build that for you and kind of on top of my storage provider, I built that kind of like tech to easy onboard that storage. And it is really like you frame it, Clara, it's like the, in Web3, we build for the users. It's not the other way around. In the cloud, you get like a suite of tools. This is what you need to work with, while in Web3, you have way more flexibility. And I think more and more people are seeing that. It's, it's also trickling up in this case from the developers and the stores admins to the, the C-level people that see all the benefits as well, because that's kind of where it starts. It starts like the tech east trying to figure out all that stuff. And it's really going up the, up, uh, up the ladder this way. Yeah. yeah. And Tom, over to you. You've obviously been in crypto for a while now. Um, why are you still bullish and why fluence? Um, well, that's tell us a very a different question. Yeah. I was I was thinking about how I'm going to answer the other question, but I, I can I can because uh, I could disagree and agree with different no, no, things no, there. No, but answer but, the other question, but, um, the broader question. Yeah. Well, I guess just on the other question, just just I can get to that one too. But on the other question, I guess I'd say a couple things. So first, CPUs versus GPUs, and we talked about GPUs a little bit on the uh, yeah, side. We can talk about that more on um, on CPUs. I think you. There are a number of use cases, but I would disagree a bit in that I think Web3 is generally has been a technology first, solution second. And I think that has impeded adoption across all manners of storage and compute and everything else. And I think that's starting to change, but I think you recognize the cloud has actually been customer-centric, driven by customers through decades of work and in billions and billions of dollars of investment. And it's a little hard for us to compete, all of us as an industry, just out of the bat, out of the gates, because we've got a cool decentralized product. No one cares about decentralization for its sake. They care about it for the benefits it brings them. And so, you know, Fluence, for example, you know, we, when we talk to Web2 customers, we don't even mention the coin, we don't even mention crypto. That can happen completely behind the scenes, even though it's critical and essential for the network to function. So I think abstracting out that is important. Um, I think that's often just led with, people lead with that in this in an industry, which I don't think is, um, 
is, is I think that slows adoption from, from Web 2, but we've got a lot of product innovation and development necessary, I think, across all of Web 3. Um, so that's, that's sort of one thing in terms of uses for CPUs, and we could talk about GPUs later, but um, you know, there's, there's a number of, of um, either episodic or um, uh, non-time essential tasks that can be done for which commoditization, of, for which really cheap CPU um, is very useful. And so you can be data pipelines, for example, which are a multi-billion dollar industry that clean and standardize data before it goes into AI models, that's huge. Um, also, in the Web3, kind of working internally, helping to, um, to do the compute for proof of stake networks and for private networks. And that requires a number of, a lot of compute resources. So you can actually be in Web3 and serve Web3 customers that are actually um, need that compute and for which decentralization matters and price also matters. So those are, those are a couple of comments I'd make on that. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, uh, I've, I've yeah, been, been, been doing this for a while and, and remain bullish despite kind of the, the, the bumps in the road we have, we have right now and we keep experiencing. But I mean, if you also look back, I, I remember very clearly um, meeting with, um, you know, we had a Fluence offsite years ago and I was excited because Bitcoin was back above 10,000. And that was like a big deal at the time. And I'm like, guys, we're back above 10,000. And they're like, really? I'm like, yes, this, is, this, is, this actually matters. And so 10,000 now at Bitcoin seems like unbelievably um, uh, small in terms of, of value. And so that wasn't that long ago where that was, uh, where that was the case. So I, I think we, we, we see the bumps, but, um, but um, the, you, know, you, you are probably close to this as well given the institutional access you have. But every day that this industry is alive is another day it's stronger, whether you see it or not. And that, that to me is, um, is, uh, is just evident by the projects and, and the, the, what we're seeing happening. Yeah, um, and, and my original question wasn't uh, just on crypto in general, but why uh, decentralized infrastructure as a whole? Sorry, I didn't really uh, frame like deep it. Deep in general. Yeah, yeah, uh. and um, but but um, we can we, we can transition others to this question as well. Um, we obviously all build in decentralized physical infrastructure. Um, this has become more of a buzzword in the last few years, but Filecoin has been at it since. 2013, 2014 was when the white paper was written. It was public in 2017, but um, all of us here know how, how, how hard hardware is. But uh, why, why DPEN? And um, would love to hear your guys' thoughts on how the rise of DPEN has impacted um, your guys' work. Sure. Yeah, so pretty much like what you said, Clara. I think, um, you know, Akash, the Akash team and the community has been at this pretty much for the last eight years. Um, our white paper, I think, was written in 2018, and uh, it actually talked about GPUs right there in the white paper, but nobody else was talking about it. Uh, and I think, um, check, my, check me on this, but I think in the last couple of years, the Masari team working with us, understanding what we were building, kind of coined the deep end word, so it kind of came out of Akash in some ways, but um, more lately, and this sort of uh, builds on what, uh, what Tom was saying, is a lot of the projects out there seem to be, um, I mean, Deepin's obviously the cool kid now. Uh, it wasn't in the last, last, last time it was, I guess, DeFi summer or something else. I wasn't even in crypto then, but um, everybody wants to be a Deepin project now. And uh, to Tom's point, uh, a lot of the projects aren't thinking about actual user value or uh, the product that they're building, and they're more focused on uh, showing that they're a deep end project somehow and then talking about a token, right? So I think the positive side of it is uh, this is one area where the only way to solve the problem actually is using crypto and decentralization. Um, the problem being access to accelerated compute that will enable us to build open systems, enable innovation so that anybody, regardless of the size of the company, has access to these compute resources. Uh, and that will drive innovation in AI. So that's all the positive things. And this is one time where, um, you know, crypto and blockchain are going to enable that. But the downside or the flip side of that is all of the uh, hype that is built around this is resulting in a lot of people uh, trying to revert to the old ways of crypto where they're just latching onto the bandwagon and trying to score a quick buck. It's not to say that every project is that way, but there is definitely a few out there that are that way. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's continue on the deep in um, conversation. Um, I do think it's like, like I, I was in Denver last time, like it was very hot there, still very hot I think, it's very hyped up. Um, 
the the way the reason why I like it is also because like you know back in the day cloud was also very hyped up and everybody started looking into what it is and, and I think like Deepin is kind of on that same like similar train. And the reason why I like it is because it piques people interest. They want to know what it is. And then they're trying to ask these very insightful questions and you get just better conversations with uh, enterprises that want to adopt this. And when I think about it, a lot of the questions come back to, uh, and I have to go back a little bit to when I was working for a very large MSP, like cloud provider myself, is that on the storage level, for instance, when, when you think about it, you have these huge companies and they usually rely on just two or three storage admins, two or three like, like network engineers and they manage the vast infrastructure that's out there. And when you, when, you, when you talk to them or talk to the enterprise, they're like, well, we do basically, we're very interested in this, looks very, very cool. It brings all these, these cool features that we just talked about around security and reliability and, and scaling out. And they're still looking for that easy way, which is being built right now. So we're solving for that as well. But around, for instance, like adopting it, they will still need to be super easy because they cannot teach all this new stuff to their admins. So they're kind of like with, like facing with this skill gap. They see all this happening. They want to adopt it, but they can't. They're kind of like constrained that way. So that's also like at Akave, we have this big focus on making sure that we're building it in a way that they're used to working with storage, for instance, like making sure we bring like, you know, feature parity, uh, equal ease of use on like, for instance, like an object interface, like AWS is uh, kind of the same way you talk to storage. So making it super easy to make sure that you kind of bridge that skill gap that way. So mm -hmm. from my pr perspective, I like it. The more they talk about it, the more they hype it up, the better conversations we have. So yeah, I'm all about it. I think, I think Deepin will onboard the next generation of crypto users. It's physical, let's first define it. You know, it is crowdsourced physical infrastructure bound together in a software network um, secured and incented by crypto economics. And so now there are, you know, 1,400 projects that want to call themselves Deepin. You know, two thirds of those are not. Obviously, Akash is, Filecoin, these are two early stage pre deepin deepin projects. Um, but I think the physicality of it is terrific. You run a Helium node, you understand why you're getting paid. You, hive, you put something in your car to map the roads, your hive mapper, it's very clear what you're doing. You, know, you buy something from WeatherXM to, tell, to, to contribute what the weather is in your location. Like these are physical, easy to understand, much easier than what the hell is cloudless computing? What's decentralized storage? Like this is hard for the average person to understand, but those networks are much easier to understand. I think that will help bring crypto much more mainstream than it has been. Um, so I'm, I'm, I think Deepin is, is beginning. It's not quite as hyped as I would like. I think it actually should be far more. I think we're very undervalued in terms of what the, the potential for what Deepin can be. Um, also, obviously, talking my own book and um, two shameless plugs. We have a Deepin day on Wednesday. So please, uh, please join us for that. And then um, with, 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 obviously, with, with yeah. Filecoin. Um, and then also... Um, I have a Deepinned podcast, just record episode 20. So if you want to learn more about Deepin, um, deepinned.xyz. Amazing. Um, I know we only have a few uh, minutes left, um, but I wanted to close by everyone talking about how we drive enterprise adoption. We know that today most of the data is stored by enterprises. How are we going to bring decentralized storage and decentralized compute to large enterprises? If everyone can rapid fire through. <laughs> sure, I try to keep it as fast as possible. So uh, it really comes down to the standard product principles, which is if you're building a product in a, a market that already has existing products and users in it, you meet the users where they are first. So if you think about cloud computing today, um, and you consider primarily there are infrastructure as a service platforms, which is AWS, GCP, Azure, you know, tier two cloud providers. And then there are what are called platform as a service um, products. So these might be things like Vercel or Netlify or anything that's basically not dealing directly with the infrastructure but providing an abstraction about it. So if you want to acquire users over, you've got to do two things. One is you've got to eliminate the crypto factor. So for people that don't want to deal with wallets, provide them a solution that doesn't involve having them set up a wallet. And then second, build those same sort of abstractions where, for example, on the infrastructure layer, if people are used to using something like an S3 service, AWS S3 is the simple storage service, 
if you look at what Azure did, for example, when they built their cloud, they built a storage service that was compatible with S3 so that people that are using AWS as a service can move to Azure. So you've got to do that exact same thing if you want people to get over to the Web3 cloud. Um, and then on the platform as a service, you've got to build those same abstractions so that the web, uh, you know, uh, web admin today that uses Versal or Netlify to spin up a web page should be able to do the same thing with your Web3 cloud. Amazing. And Angela, I feel like he kind of a good entryway for Akave. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, we're building that if you, uh, if you need it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah we're, we're collaborating on that, so that's really cool in the future. Um, I do, I, I, I fully uh, agree with that, and I think making it super easy, like I mean super, super easy for people to adopt it, which means bringing the same technology that they're using today to the masses for decentralized storage, for instance, is, is crucial for adoption. Enterprise, like the adoption of enterprise, when, when anything decentralized will come to the next companies that come with all these easy to use interfaces, that all these easy to use products clearly stated on what they do, how they work, how to adopt them, how to put them in there. Um, like in this case, data lifecycle management product that they're using. Um, I get these questions a lot around like very specific Web2 uh, um, platforms, like for instance, like a Veeam, like, you know, can we use like a Kave to integrate that directly into our stack? And the answer is yes, that we're building towards that. And that's what they want. They just want something to plug in exactly where they're already doing their specific, in this case, storage a thing or compute thing or, or whatever it is uh, moving forward. I'd just say three things. Productize, clear value proposition, and abstract out the use of crypto. Those are the three things that need to happen for widespread enterprise adoption. Amazing. Well, thank you everyone for uh, joining us at this panel, and we will be around if you guys want to talk to any of the panelists after. Thank you for having us. <laughs> <laughs>